Okay, so hello and uh, welcome everybody for this sessions of the OASH OSS uh, Spring Talks. Uh, my name is Falk Kretschneider. I'm historian and uh, associate professor at um, the OASH OSS, the Paris School of Advanced Studies in Social Science. And I have the great pleasure to introduce and moderate this session with my colleague Rainer Maria Kiso around the theme Law and Judgment. Rainer Kiso is professor at OHSS and a lawyer. He holds the chair, the Order of Law, and is a specialist of the theory, philosophy, and history of law, especially the private law in Europe. He studied in Germany at the Goethe University of Frankfurt on the Main, and in France at the Univers University of Paris II, Panthéon Assas. In 1995, he earned his doctorate degree in Frankfurt with a thesis on the natural law of law. In 2003 and 2007, he completed uh, two habilitations, the highest university degree in many European countries, one on credit in the risk society and another on the alphabet of law, which was published as a book by Suerkamp in 2004, here is it. For many years, Rainer Kiso was a member of the Max Planck Institute of Legal History in Frankfurt and founding member of the Young Academy at the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science. In 2009, he became professor of private and international law in Bremen. And one year later, in 2010, he was elected at the USS. It is impossible to list all of Rainer Kiso's activities. He's the author of eight books, including The Unity of Law, a book published in French in 2014. He has published more than 200 articles and is the founder and editor of several journals, including Grief, Revue sur les mondes du droit. He teaches not only at OHOSS, but also in Switzerland and other countries where he is regularly invited to give guest lectures. Last but not least, he is the director of the Centre Georg Simmel, a research center at OHOSS dedicated to the cooperation of French and German researchers in social sciences. Today, Rainer Kiso will give us an insight into his seminar, Law and Judgment, among other things. The seminar deals with the question of how legal decisions are made. He will now speak to us for about 45 minutes. Afterwards, where will be the opportunity, opportunity to ask him questions and discuss his research with him. You can, of course, ask your questions in English, but also in French and even in German or Italian if you want. But now, Rainer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Fuck you forget you forgot the uh, Serbo Croatian language. So if there is someone who speaks uh, Croatian or Serb or Macedonian or whatever, um, you can also ask a question. So thank you very much, Falk, for for this very kind um, introduction. And um, uh, uh, you know, we are I think supposed to to also to tell a little bit. Um, to the audience how we make generally the seminars here uh, at the EHSS, uh, EHSS, École aux études en sciences sociales. Um, uh, so I just would like to say to you that uh, generally uh, I speak, uh, let's say, uh, uh, just like this in a free way, huh? and I don't read the text huh, in my seminars. Huh? But for this um, occasion, uh, especially because there is no audience. Oh, so there is audience. You are the audience, of course, huh? but uh, I don't see you. Huh? Uh, I don't see anything except ourselves. Huh? And so, and the two ladies which are here helping us with the technical and organizational and so on uh, uh, matters. Huh? Um, and so it's uh, rather difficult. <laughs> I feel to speak freely if I don't know to whom I'm speaking. So this is the reason why I will so present you uh, some thoughts um, in, a, in, a, in, in a more or less written way. Huh? 
and um, and then uh, 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 indeed, as Falk, uh, uh, my colleague and friend, uh, said um, uh, uh, before some minutes, uh, it would be really great to have some questions from you. Um, um, also, because if you don't ask questions, it is too Falk to ask questions. And, um, and, and, and so, because we know each other, this is very good, but it would be really, really fine that um, we could have a sort of conversations, conversation with, with you outside. So, law and judgment. Huh? Um, could, can uh, put the, quest, the, the, the theme also in another way, huh? uh, in a more philosophical uh, way, perhaps, huh? and say as title, uh, uh, there is no hermeneutics between law and judgment. Or, if you would take a sort of historical uh, point of view, a perspective, huh, you could say also um, how the traditional methods of interpretation came to an end exactly in the year 1912. Um, so that means uh, 110 years ago, not earlier and not after that. So, um, I would like also to, to put a sort of um, motto uh, before, um, before this little speech of today. And um, I will not uh, reveal you the author of this motto, but it is one of the main persons of this, um, of this um, uh, lecture. Uh, so, the, the motto is, um, but what does but what does such a rationalist know about real life? But what does such a rationalist know about real life? I think uh, during the lecture you will you will see um, uh, uh, what it is about. So, in what way is a decision made? This is a reflective question on the phenomenon of the legal par excellence, the judgment. What actually happens there? How does it come about? The answer to this complex of questions moves between commitment and freedom, between law and sovereignty, between deduction and decision. Let us begin in order to clarify what is at stake with an end, the end of the notion of the process of producing laws and judgments that is common in democracy. Let us begin by talking about a situation in which hermeneutics, enlightenment and law are on the defensive, as they are, by the way, today. And if it is always a little bit complicated, um, I say it especially for those of you which are not um, jurists or lawyers and uh, perhaps from other disciplines in the, in the social and, and uh, sciences and humanities. Um, uh, if we speak in English, in the English language of law, it's always for us, you, you continental Europeans, uh, it's rather difficult to know what, what is meant by, by this word law, because we have in our languages, Italian, French, German, and so on, we have two words to designate um, uh, what is um, what is at stake, and and and, and so so you, you could uh, in French, for for instance, um, this is um, uh, droit et loi. In German, it is for instance uh, uh, Gesetz und Recht. Huh? Um, uh, in Italian, la legge il diritto, huh? uh, and so 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 in English, it's always a little bit slippery huh? uh, because you uh, to, to talk about law because you don't know always uh, what is. Uh, what is meant, and um, if you are French speaking, and if you saw the publicity huh, of the Spring Talks, the e H E S S Spring Talks, um, uh, I don't know, there is, I think, an uh, English version. Huh, um, the, my lecture, our enterprise for today is. Um, is noticed as law and judgment, which is uh, quite correct. Huh? Uh, but in the French uh, uh, translation, which, but this is not an offense to, to anyone, huh? uh, uh, in the translation, what, which what made, what was made um, 
I think by the authorities of our school, I don't know. Um, the, the, the translation uh, is um, uh, droit et jugement, which is false, but doesn't matter. Huh? It should be, of course, should have been, of course, um, uh, 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 loi et jugement and not droit et jugement. Um, but whatever, this is um, between these two words, what is law, what is droit, what is loi. Um, it's an old history and philosophy of law, which is hidden. So, um, um, so let us first talk about 1922. So 10 years later than 1912. Let us first talk about 1922, the year in which Carl Schmitt, one of the central figures of the political, literary, and scientific 20th century, wrote down a sentence that has become world famous since then. I quote, sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception. In 1919, the Weimar Republic in Germany had adopted a constitution which, according to its Article 48, gives the President of the Reich the power to take, I quote, necessary measures, including by means of armed force, in certain cases characterized by the non-fulfillment of a country's obligations or by serious disturbance a threat to public safety and order. The word exception is not used. And Karl Schmidt himself continues his first sentence by embedding it in a legal, in a legal justification, a legal, as he called it, legal definition of sovereignty. A quote, it's a long quotation, I will, of course, tell you when the quotation comes to its end. Sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception. This definition can alone do justice to the concept of sovereignty as a borderline concept. For the concept of boundary does not mean a confused concept as, it, as in the impure terminology of popular literature but the concept of the outermost sphere. Accordingly, its definition cannot refer to the normal case, but to a borderline case. The following will show, all this Karl Schmidt, the following will show that the state of exception is to be understood here as a general concept of a theory of the state not as some kind of emergency decree or state of siege. That the state of exception is suitable in the eminent sense for the legal definition of sovereignty has a systematic, legally logical reason. Schmidt, Schmidt, Schmidt. Indeed, the decision on the state of exception is a decision in the eminent sense. A general rule such as the normally applicable legal principle can never cover an absolute exception and therefore cannot fully justify a decision that a genuine exception case exists. When Mohl, a German jurist of the 19th century, say, says that the examination of whether a state of emergency exists cannot be a legal one, he, assume, he assumes that a decision in the legal sense must be completely derived from the content of a norm. But, Schmidt, 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 but that is the question. In the general sense, as Mohl pronounces the phrase, it is merely an expression of constitutional liberalism and fails to recognize the independent meaning of the decision, end of quote. In order to be able to understand the state of exception, or rather because it would be presumptuous to believe that one can understand, in order to be able to locate the state 
of exceptional sovereignty in the legal sense, which for Carl Schmidt is related to it, one must, one must go back in time, in which Schmidt appeared, appeared not yet as the antipode of Hans Kelsen, the other great jurist of the 20th century of public law, was not yet the first revolutionary of Nazi law, and after 1945, the cursed professor of law who ultimately could only teach at home in the deep German province. So one must go back when he was only 23 years old, before he was the greatest butcher, if I may say so, in law uh, of the 20th century. It was really you will forgive me this uh, this uh, this word, but he was really the certainly the greatest asshole of uh, the 20th century in the juristic sphere in Europe. That was in 1912, when Karl Schmidt wrote and published his second book after his dissertation on criminal law, the terminological study on guilt and types of guilt should taste these, these titles and these uh, expressions of Karl Schmidt with what was what happened later on from 1933 on so 20 21 years later the second book is entitled gesetz und urteil so law and judgment a study of the problem of legal practice. One can already see the taste of rhetoric, rhetoric style, more precisely the taste for terms in opposition, for words in war, for which he was to become famous, such as grand enemy, legality, legit, legitimacy, theology, politics, rule, exception state, movement, people, land, sea, but also Jew, Aryan. It all began with the study of the relationship, law, judgment. Is there harmony or tension, deduction or deconnection, interpretation or decision, continuity, continuity or break? It is obvious that the whole question of the rule of law, and thus, from today's perspective, the triad of hermeneutics, enlightenment, law, is inextricably linked to the question of the state of exception. It is strange, but understandable, that law and judgment did not attract more public attention than it did. The second edition in 1968, also a key year of the 20th century, um, the second edition in 1968 and translations in French and in Italian, the letter by an actual fascist philosopher. Karl Schmidt is, by the way, for the rest, one of the most translated authors a la mode in the humanities and social sciences. The author's affiliation with National Socialism obscured the beginnings of Karl Schmidt's thinking, which was in no way affected by what happened later, unlike the writing of writings of the Weimar Republic, which many critics believed could be directly linked to Nazi crimes, the supposed radiance that has not always been convincingly demonstrated. And the state of exception in his political theology of 1922 was the prominent beginning of this intellectual uh, causality, which supposedly led directly to evil, as if it were the ideas that ruled over life and not vice versa. But the positivism of ideas which dictates what we must do, this positivism 
which makes actions flow automatically from the idea law, which unshakably derives judgments from norms, this machine, which led us to what we do, this mechanics of the machine is a lie. A lie which in the inevitability of the consequences in relation to the cause law could make the lawyers after 1945 appear irresponsible in the truest sense of the word, because in this way it was not them, not their personality and not their person, but the legis uh, legislative programmers and the positivists and legal educators with their dogmatic teaching at the university who forced them to follow and execute the laws, the, the decrees, decrees, the rules in force. And isn't this exactly what we call the rule of law? The rule of the law, the commitment to the law, to be simply mouth of the law by means of amenoidical applications? Sovereignty is who decides on the state of emergency. A legal analysis of this state of legal affairs, paradoxically, the state of exception does not dictate anything to us either, because for example, for Germany 100 years ago, it was subject to Article 48 of the Constitution of the Weimar Republic with all its possible interpretation. It has legality, so a legal analysis of this state of legal affairs leads us to the core of the double specter of Recht, Gesetz, law as jurisprudence, jurisdiction, and law as statutes. It is therefore appropriate to approach this strange pair of Recht, Gesetz head-on and analyze the, normal, the normality of the exception and the exceptional nature of the normal. And this is quite contrary to what Carl Schmidt himself decreed in 1922, when he denied that the extraordinary could be associated with the normal. And at the same time, in agreement, with what follows a few lines later, where Karl Schmidt says, says the opposite, when the decision to know whether there is an exception is linked to the interpre interpretive maneuvers in the constitutional state, in liberalism, the interpretative maneuvers that Karl Schmidt incidentally so denigrates above all because of their deductive, it has dependence-based mechanics. In sensu stricto, dependent on what? By the law as statutes, gesetz, loi. And indeed, the exceptional case is in reality not different from the normal case, if the criticism of deductionism is meant seriously. The question of what law is and the problem of sovereignty is certainly part of the legal sphere. The question of law will not elicit an adequate answer for either the normal or the exceptional if it misjudges the independent meaning of decision. So, 1912. In 1912, in the first of his famous first sentences, Karl Schmidt asks himself a question which he considers, I quote, the decisive question. I continue with Schmidt. When is a judicial decision correct? End of quoted question. In his analysis of the path to be taken between law and judgment, he destroys the traditional foundations 
traditional ways of interpretation, known ways of interpretations, in order to establish the law and its state, the constitutional state. Metaphysics, metaphysics, nature, religion, that goes without saying. The lights of the Enlightenment have been shining for some time, but also positivism, logicism, legisocentrism. No, the will, however it may be conceived individually, collectively, supra-individually, the will of the law or of the legislator, all these things can be forgotten. They are fictions, just like the interpretation, the legal subsumption that would lead to correct decisions. One can see here in his criticism of the method of the prevailing theories about legal decision and the role of the judge, one can see here in his sarcasm about the belief that one can arrive at an absolutely certain judgment by deducting from legal premises, one already understands here Karl Schmitt's deep reservations about the possibility of a constitutional state, which would be nothing more than a technique, a procedure to achieve results, a Rocosonian rule of law, the demise of the constitution, constitutional state, digestion by means of ducks, such as Jacques Vaucanson's world famous 18th century automaton. In short, it shows that there would be nothing but the law from which one cannot escape because it is executed, applied as a being in force, and this application is nothing but a mechanism. No, no, the law is not an automaton, or more precisely, the law does not slip out of any and be it the most legal, if this false superlative may be allowed, automatism. The range of interpretation cannot be restricted by reductio at minimum. No, the law is in the deepest sense possible decision. And this applies to all cases, both the most normal and the most extraordinary. Every case is a borderline case. The normality of the case does not exist. Or, to put it in another way, every case is normal. That means a case is a case is a case. The case structure is always the same. Kaczmit does not say it like that, but let's put it in this way. The structure of law is binary. And this, bin this binary is its very existence. And the characteristic of the law to always be in opposition, in confrontation, is not only to be grasped by the code legal illegal, as Jürgen Habermas, great opponent, the lawyer and sociologist Niklas Luhmann thought. It can be grasped by, by starting from something or rather from a situation, a situation which is parallel to the legal communication about what is legal or illegal namely the confrontation of at least two parties, whether natural or legal persons in private law, whether one of the parties in the state, as in criminal law or in public law. The binarity with multilateral extensions, mixtures, positions of all kinds, 
is found not only in the code of legal communication, legal, illegal, but especially in the society itself. Prosecutor accused, civil servant, citizen, creditor, debtor. By staging law since ancient times, in this contradictory way, it constantly realizes the idea that nothing is lost a priori, and conversely, nothing is gained a priori, never. Otherwise, this would mean that structurally and even essentially, there would be idiots on the side of the defeated parties who would have given themselves up to litigation in the most ignorant way. Indeed, idiots do not know how to make deductions. They know nothing about logic. But indeed, that's it. Logic is not at the heart of the law and therefore of the process, the trial, the litigation. Hermeneutics, interpretation, classical methods of subsumption. These are deductive disguises for the reasons, the justifications of the judgments. These are, if I may say so, public relations. PR enterprises, which have become necessary since the death of God, the prince, nature, and reason. They're all dead. You lose your trial, but you do not lose face, legally speaking. A victory would have been and remains possible in the end, if only because there are objections, appeals, revisions of all kinds. And above all, there's always a next time. And if you can't do more yourself, maybe someone else can. Games are never played just once and for all, at least not on a social level. For the judge of the verdict, the master of the game of law, has not made an edict of truth that nips any question in the butt and makes itself common with the truth in real, if something like this exists, in real truth, he has merely given a judgment and by virtue of the legal authority of the state, he has been just empowered and entitled to issue it. That is all. The deciding judge is not legally better than lawyers or other judges. It is just that um, he is the one who decides. And this decision encounters the paradoxes of the decision, paradoxes that remove the decision for far as stars from the logical consequentialists' deductive logic. Karl Schmidt, 1912. Law and Judgment. Niklas Luhmann, Pathin, since the 1960s, for example, the Law of Society. Jacques Derrida, 1994, Force of Law. There is a whole, there's a whole, anything but explicit history of dissent in which it would be advisable to include many others. For example, Rudolf von Jering in the 19th century or the digests of Roman law. So that means centuries, uh, millenniums ago. There is a whole uh, uh, anything but explicit history so of dissent, affiliation of the destruction of logicity and the construction of the freedom of law. 
which lies in his rhetoric, his ambivalence. These paradoxes or aporias are counted up to three. You count always to three. This is also a rhetorical figure. Um, two is not enough and four is too much. Firstly, the law cannot wait. It must be judged. That is the prohibition of denial of justice. Exemplary, for example, in, in, in Article 4 of the French Civil Code, the Code Civil, silence, obscurity, or the insufficiency of the law do not offer any excuse for not judging. It must be judged, even in the face of silence, darkness, and insufficiency. The law has no time to be informed about everything, to know everything. The law wanders, wanders in the night as a wanderer in the night of not knowing. It's a little bit melancholic, I'm sorry. Secondly, the law creates the rule by which it makes its judgments. There's no given case. The case is that strange something where facts and laws, statutes, jurisprudences, and so on, meet. Only that facts and laws do not simply exist. They are products that come from different angles, different readings, in short, different interpretations. And these actual and legal products touch and influence each other. This can be described as the pendulum view. You know, uh, if you play piano, uh, uh, you have the pendulum huh? for the tact. Um, this can be described as a pendulum view, notorious from law studies and formulated by Karl Engisch, legal uh, theorist, private lawyer uh, from Germany from the 20th century, in his introduction to legal thinking. So the pendulum view between facts and norms, but also within facts and norms. One can see very well that this jurisdictional metronome is there to turn heads and minds if one does not go astray. And in this situation, you need a judgment, a decision. Thirdly, the law is thus a decision. A decision on what is accepted as fact a decision on what is accepted as the applicable norm and applicable, applicable excuse me, content of the norm. A decision on what is the relationship between the two. The law is decision. As we can see, it is not a question of yes, if, or if, then. It is not a causalistic machine to calculate and control the course of the law of the lower and higher jurisdictions. The law cannot be told how to say it. The decision is in a very basic sense, a decision about something that cannot be decided with logical common sense. If we could decide with the help of precautions in terms of time, intelligence, and information, we would not decide. We would calculate, actually wait up. We would deduce, we would achieve a result. But the law is not a result. The law 
at the center of which is judgment, decides the undecidable. This is an aporia that cannot be solved. Otherwise, it would not be an aporia. In this case, there's only one argumentation a contrario. So, if it were not so, try to, to, to grasp it, huh? if it were not so, there would be no decision but calculation, result, consequence, finally truth. A truth without alternative, a truth that kills or imprisons nowadays, at least in our European region. The question is, what is Europe? So, Russia, uh, at least the uh, Occidental Russia, uh, generally is counted into Europe. I'm not sure that it is uh, uh, um, uh, any, uh, any more the case. Um, so, a truth that kills, that obliges, that imposes. The loser would really have lost without any chance in advance, a priori, because calculation three times three always makes nine. Calculation knows no alternative, other views, other horizons. And it is this horizon that is opened up by the paradox of a decision that cannot help but decide the undecidable. Stripped of the totalitarianism of calculable truth, of the intransigent domination of logocentric rationality, law, with its binary structure and its aporia of choice, remains free. Free in the attribution of legality or illegality of human behavior. Lack of time. Construction of the rule. Decision of the undecidable. Voila. Here we are. The main elements to not to no longer be able to dream of a constitutional state in the classical sense of the word. Even every, every human action generates the possibility of a legal evaluation according to the laws in force. And for some time now, we have been adding a moral complication according to the laws in force and in accordance with human rights, which multi the possible interpretations. The commentaries on Article 1 of the Basic Law, so the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Germany alone, the famous and as short as it is simple article on human dignity, which is unviolable, fill the shelves of libraries all over, all over the world. All in all, if one does not close one's mind to this view, and to be honest, how else could one, in view of the logical incoherence in the judgments of all times, which, lead, which leads one to strongly suspect that it is precisely this uncertainty, this ambivalence, that is essential and characteristic of the law, a law that deeply, and even in times of medieval order orderlies, when the bodies perished or not, embodies freedom, which is of course subject of changes in history and in present. All in all can be said, Cameron is he who decides, or Cameron is who is judge. But as always, things are not quite so simple. 
and as some certainly think, disastrous in law and in the case of Karl Schmidt. The young man's answer to his question about the correctness of a decision is still missing. So 1912. The answer does not lie in the law, in the method, in the will. The answer does not lie in any mode of logical imitation. There is no legal after philosophy that is only a pseudo, pseudo, pseudo philosophy. There are only the other, the other lawyers, the other judges. This means, as Karl Schmidt excellently puts it, I quote, the judicial decision is correct today when it can be assumed that another judge would have made the same decision. Another judge here means the empirical type of the modern jurist, end of quote. So, not philosophy, not sociology, not psychology, but a practice, a practice that is not prescriptive normative. It is not a matter of judging like others, or even of having to judge like others. This would raise the same problems of interpretation as with laws. It is not a question of precedence or prejudicial force. Karl Schmidt simply says a banality that shakes the Oedipus of the rule of law, which is based on causality, on the cause and effect model, a banality that puts the sovereignty of the decision in the glaring light of reality and does not allow the sovereign decision of the judge to float freely in a sort of anything goes, as uh, you can see it. Uh, Paul, Paul, Paul Feyerabend. For the correctness, for the, this correctness of the judicial decision is an autonomous evaluation within the legal system, of which jurisprudence, jurisdiction, is the core. This law remains definite, even though it contradicts traditional notions of the primacy of the statute law. No, the law is not regulated, ordered, determined by statutes. It is determined by itself, by all the other judges who live under the same roof as the judge decider in the case being heard. It is an auto-determination, a self-determination that changes course over time. Hence, the decision remains sovereign at all times. Often, but not always, there is agreement. But it is not intended. It is not deductive. It is not a consequence, the consequence of anything. It is simply the way it is. And it is observable and can be qualified as correct or false, according to the formula quoted, a posteriori, afterwards, for example, in the printed or electronic collections of jurisprudence, jurisdictions that exist, to be a witness both to the certainty and the freedom of the law, to its rhetorical character. These collections show how supposedly normal cases become borderline. The legal history of sexual or racial discrimination is one example for this. And how supposedly borderline cases become normal. The history of German European consumer protection law 
is one example of this. If that is the way things are, it is better, it is better to drop the distinction between normal and borderline cases. They are cases, that is all. And these cases must be decided in a sovereign way, which means that the one who decides, the one who decides is sovereign. And since sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception, the state of exception is anchored in every decision of the sovereign judge. It goes without saying that the consequences of this view of things, the law is irrational, rhetorical, nonetheless determined, but only in the sense of the observation a posteriori, never in the logical normativistic sense, never therefore as an enforceable enlightenment hermeneutic or hermeneutic enlightenment program. It is clear that this state of legal things, the state of affairs, which is profoundly confirmed by the relentless affirmation of the independence of the judge in most of the current free democratic states and mirrored by the attack on this independence in authoritarian democracies, Poland, Hungary, and so on, it is obvious that the concept of the rule of law is fundamentally disturbed by this perspective. Neither cause nor predictability are possible, only judgments. What to do in such a situation? Leave the notions of normality and ex exceptionality behind. The state of emergency or exception is no more to fear than the normal state. It is not the exceptional that stands in the way of normality, because the normal is always extraordinary, the case of a decision. Normal and extraordinary are rhetorical figures, forms to qualify a content as desirable or not. And here again, and here again, we are faced with the paradox that Carl Schmidt has analyzed and which we may or may not be faced with again today. In 1932, the Weimar Republic is in a severe crisis. Hitler, Adolf Hitler, Ante Portas, Carl Schmidt, now a famous professor of law, finishes a little book on the 10th of July, Legality and Legitimacy. legitimacy. Legality and Legitimacy. What to do when the democratic parliamentary system collapses in a mixture of extremism, immobilism, neutralism, and when, and when the old normal forms of democratic political functioning no longer produce results that are committed to democratic values. In other words, what to do when legalism fails? Not in its mechanism, a mechanism that will remain in full murderous force a few months later, and even in the coming years, 1933 till 1945, uh, but in its rep Republican content, but in its Republican content. In such a situation, should we not fight by means of a state of exception against electoral rituals that leave room for populism of all kinds and thus make it possible in a political state of exception to regain in a more or less short term democratic normality which should not only be of a formal nature. 
think on the situation in some countries uh, today. The answer, the answer does not lie as one might think with Carl Schmidt in a distinction that is a theoretical, that is as theoretical as it is aseptic and sterile between a state of exception and a normal state with pre-assigned grades. We are not in a hospital and in the emergency room where everything must be clean. The answer lies in our ability and willingness to act and to fight for the rights of all and the law as a contingent form. It is precisely the contingency that gives the law the power and opportunity of freedom. A contingency which does not regard the result in the mode of hermeneutic enlightenment as a bringer of salvation, but rather is for the decisive and open form or dealing with our conflicts in society. Every case is exceptional, be it only for the one who wins or loses. Certainly, the characteristics of the law are never to tell us in advance what will be decided is not reassuring in the sense of the soporific bedtime readings we provide for children. But the sovereignty of the one who decides, like the one each of us possesses, has a price, never knowing what is coming. That is the normality of exceptionality in liberal democratic societies. So, for instance, in France and in Germany. I firmly believe that we must deal with it and live with it. The poetic work of a contemporary of the young Karl Schmidt continues, continues to be decisive for the situation we find ourselves in, much like Schmidt's early work itself. In 1912, not only law and judgment appeared as a book, but in the night of the 22nd to 23rd September, 1912, the judgment, the judgment was written down in Prague. And two years later, Franz Kafka, Franz Kafka, you know, Franz Kafka, began to write the book, which remained a fragment, which finally held up the mirror of the real world experience to the traditional methods of interpretation, for which Karl Schmidt had only mockery left in 1912. In this world literature, only one thing is certain, the process, the trial never ends, except through death. So thank you very much, it was a little bit uh, depressive perhaps, but uh, I'm nevertheless uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Rainer, for this really exciting and rich uh, lecture. So I have uh, some questions, uh, but uh, I first uh, would like to, to give uh, you the opportunity to ask, uh, uh, to ask, uh, to contribute to the discussion. Uh, you can ask questions in English, French, German, Italian, if you if you want. I look our technical support. Not yet. Okay. Uh, you reflect a little bit. Uh, so, Rainer, uh, thank you very much. I think because we can be, begin uh, to come back uh, to this uh, difference uh, between uh, Gesetz and uh, Recht, Recht in, in, in German uh, and in French and in Italian, um, uh, a difference um, 
but uh, there's only one word in in English. You you did your lecture in in, in English. So how how do you deal with this? Yeah, this is a uh, it's really a difficult question. Huh? Um, um, because it's also a sort of psychological question, because I don't know, for instance, um, how um, English-speaking people um, uh, think this word law. Of course, you have many, many theoretical um, uh, 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 texts and reflections about these linguistic differences, huh? Uh, which reflects perhaps, but, but in a certain sense, not really a difference between the the, the continental uh, uh, law system and the and the, um, and the and the common law uh, uh, system. Uh, I think it makes, in fact, a difference if from the most young age you hear always law. Um, as the one word which covers the whole thing, if I may say so, and or if you if you have from the beginning on a sort of distinction uh, in this whole thing of law, that means the distinction between Gesetz und Recht, Droit et Loi. Um, so I I have not an answer, but. The, the answer would, would interest me is a psychological one, or let's say an, an answer which deals with um, with a perhaps psycho cognitive uh, uh, matters. Huh? Uh, what the words are doing uh, um, uh, with our with our possibility to 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 represent or to present or to construct. The world, but let let me for I don't know uh, uh, if I may um, um, uh, pick up which is behind perhaps and certainly this question which is often behind uh, a question of this of this type huh? that means radical difference or not to say a real uh, uh, canyon. Hmm? Uh, not surmountable, or not, uh, there's no, there's no bridge huh, between the continental, that means Continental. European, huh, and, um, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the common law, huh? um, and it's always, you can read it always, every, everywhere. Huh? It's a great difference. Huh? We here in, in Europe. Huh? We are based on uh, continental Europe. We are based on these well, written more or less huh? statute law. Huh? That means we are driven by gazettes and by uh, uh, what is it in French? Gazettes, uh, loi, 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 huh? uh, and la legge, la legge, huh? la legge, loi. Gesetz, and um, and in the, in the, in the, uh, let's say the, the Anglo-American system, ah, oh, they don't have any Gesetze, huh? um, which is for, for, the, for England, huh? uh, it is more or less, huh? but but for, for the United States of America, for instance, if you you look at the, at the at the tax law, for instance, huh? uh, it's tremendous. Huh? It's enormous uh, 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 statute texts that, that are produced. Huh? But nevertheless, huh? they are driven by the precedents, so by jurisdiction. Hmm? So the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court, so the court, the judges, the one thing, the only thing which counts, it's is so the decisions, and especially the, the decisions of the of the um, uh, Supreme Court. But uh, there is a misunderstanding. I think I don't. I'm not telling the truth, of course. But I think there is a real misunderstanding about the 
very nature, if I may pronounce the word to whom I give no importance uh, in my in my thinking in general, because there is no nature of anything. But uh, but but you have to 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 speak in a certain way, and so you cannot you cannot not saying something. And so so the very nature of law is not what we call gazettes, so the statutes, and even not in Europe, because the whole text, or the whole, the whole what I what was presenting to you, huh, uh, shows. Okay, you can agree or not agree or disagree. Huh? Uh, it's up to you, but um, but shows that, that even if you have statutes, these statutes are not a natural law. If I, we are here in the seventh floor of the building in the 40, in the 54 Boulevard Aspire in Paris, in the center of Paris, beautiful. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, open the windows here because there are windows, but they are not openable. Uh, but uh, if I took a hammer, a hammer and I broke, break the window and I'm jumping on the window, the window, I will fall. There's no doubt. But the law is not like this. Uh, the law is not a suicide, I would say, in this sense. Um, so um, uh, uh, the, the distinction between the two legal systems is much less important that it is usually thought, because in Europe, in Germany, in France, the last word is not to the legislator, the last word is to the judge. And at the end, even it's another, it's a little bit different, uh, the function of the Supreme Court uh, is different from the, for instance, uh, Constitutional Court in Germany, huh? Um, but the last word, the judges, the high judges have the last word, but not because they are the most, let's say, the most mm, intelligent and the most professional, and they know, because these are the high judges, the highest judges, that they know what the law, in the sense of statutes, Statute. Hmm? Uh, uh, no, it's only because they have the last word. They have the last word because they are the last ones. <laughs> That's all. And there are no other ones. Of course, we could say there is a supra constitutional court or the super super constitutional court. But uh, by the way, we have such things. We have international jurisdiction. We will see what will be judged about the atrocities, for instance, which the Russian army, if it is proved, but it seems that it is not a fake, <laughs> um, uh, did yesterday or the day before yesterday. Huh? So you have, but, but, but even there on the international level, you could imagine other hierarchies, hmm? but at one point you have to end and to stop, and you stop when you stop. I, I, I agree with the principles of, uh, of the thinking, but uh, there's a question why we need laws, gesetze, why they are law. Uh, it happens uh, sometimes, uh, remember in Germany, uh, I don't know the situation in, in France, but remember in, in, in Germany that the highest court asked the parliament mm -hmm. to change the law, the gesetze. So, why we yeah. have gazettes? Yeah. Uh, so wh wh why we have gazettes? This is um, this would be also, I think, to, it would be better to ask, let's say, other people than me could better uh, uh, answer to this fundamental question. Uh, you know, the jurists are. Uh, 
uh, are not philosophers and historians and sociologists and psychologists and so on. Uh, the Druids are uh, yeah, technicians, more or less. Huh? Um, and um, uh, 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 why the society and people need uh, laws, huh? I would say, let's read Durkheim again, huh? for instance. Huh? Um, um, of course, if I may say it a little bit in a very simplistic way, huh? of course, um, uh, uh, human societies have always, and you can uh, always, since we know something about them, they always had laws. Huh? And laws in the sense of statutes. That are, and statutes that can be, uh, 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 let's say, a, a sort of a normative order which is outside morality. So that means sort of being together in society. But a real coercive manner to organize society. You can see this in the Mesopotamian um, Ebene plains, between Euphrates and Tigris, so in Iraq, um, uh, where the first uh, legal texts, which are contracts, or contract, a contract is nothing else than a statute between two or more uh, parties. Um, um, so, so, and, and you can see it on the steel, 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 I don't know how do you call it, uh, the, not steel, but the steel and the, 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 the sort of uh, uh, the monuments uh, uh, from Hammurabi, uh, which you see in the Louvre. Huh? So, 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 societies always had written or unwritten laws in the form of statutes. Um, but the case you mentioned, it's completely true, of course. Um, uh, uh, this is a, uh, the normative control uh, uh, of the constitutional uh, court in Germany huh? uh, when they say, okay, you have this law, uh, you have to change it. Huh? They are, never say you have to change it in this way, huh? but they give a sort of frame huh? uh, uh, which is um, which is to be respected. Huh? Um, but what does it mean? It means that the legislator indeed has to uh, make a new law within this frame. Hmm? Um, but when the legislator did it and the new law replaced the ancient unconstitutional law, I would like to say in French, eh ben, ça va uh, so in English you say perhaps, I don't know, and again, the same game, huh? uh, the same game again. Huh? That means interpretation, there are judges, there will be, uh, there will be cases, huh? uh, you have to put together the new law, the new uh, dispositives of the law with the, with the facts, huh? uh, but all of this is constructed and construction. So, so I'm sorry, perhaps I have a too much radical constructivistic view of all this, huh? but, um, but uh, to be honest, I don't see how it could be as because uh, otherwise, huh? because uh, that if, if it would be otherwise, then we would not have all this mess with um, judgment, judgments um, and appeals and the Supreme Court, and then again new uh, judgments for other cases which are similar, but never the same. They cannot be the same because there are other people. And and so on and so on. And despite the fact, uh, and, and no, no matter uh, if it is uh, um, uh, criminal law, um, civil law, 
uh, public law. So I'm afraid to be obliged, from my point of view, to say that even if the Constitutional Court uh, says to the Parliament, make new, law, make new laws, uh, that doesn't mean that from now on, if the new laws are there, everything is okay. No, it's a rebelot. I, I understand one, but uh, I even ask me why we need law. <coughs> Why we need law, gesetze, yeah, yeah. and uh, I think uh, so. I, 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 I. Yeah, but I think your, 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 your answer is uh, law has nothing to do with law. So gesetze has nothing sense. to do with recht. Yeah. Uh, so uh, 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 our politi it, political it, it, programs or, yeah, yeah. or like this. That, this is. Um, I agree with that. And also, uh, um, it it convenes to make distinctions. So you cannot uh, know anything about the world if you don't make distinctions. And this is the uh, difference with, um, let's say, naturalistic and essentialistic and essential uh, views on our uh, surrounding. That means our society, uh, in which people people are living and people are speaking and people people are communicating. Huh? So all these communications cannot be let's say, um, uh, dumped huh? uh, by, by, um, by, uh, by, 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 by a certain sense of truth or essence or, um, or, or, or truth. Huh? So it convenes to make distinctions. And in law, and now I speak voluntarily of law, in an indistinctive way, it, con it, it is, uh, it is uh, fruitful to uh, make a distinction. Distinction between, between what? A distinction between the two things which in the other languages are uh, present. That means statutes and jurisdiction. And Jurisprudence. Jurisprudence has another meaning in English also because it could also mean a sort of philosophy and thinking, a reflection about law. Uh, but in the um, and in German, for instance, uh, also in French, uh, jurisprudence, jurisprudence uh, uh, has also different meanings. Could can uh, can say uh, uh, can mean. Um, uh, uh, let's say the, the the law as such history of law thinking about law legal thought and so on huh? but also the jurisdiction um, however um, make a distinction draw a distinction so um, the distinction between recht and gesetz is in fact is not in an essentialist way, uh, as I and others, of course, uh, um, uh, put it. Huh? Um, uh, this is the distinction between law and politics, or politics and law. Um, uh, because laws as statutes, or statutes as, as law, don't. Gesetz, uh, so Gesetze, uh, Loi. Alleged. Tout ça, ce sont des programmations, comme vous avez, uh, uh, as you said. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm I'm a little bit tired now, and to speak always in English, and so I'm I I I, I say something sometimes something in, in, in French or in German. Huh? So um, uh, as you said it, uh, as it as you put it uh, rightly, I think huh? um, uh, statutes are the. Um, uh, is a political, a political programs. So it's a programmation. It's, it's a sort of, a, uh, um, uh, yeah, political program. Why or, or in which sense? Huh? Yeah, because it's not the lawyers who makes, who make the, the 
the statutes, the, 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 the law, the, the tax fact, law. In fact, uh, uh, yes, <laughs> in, in, in the uh, parliament in, there are a lot of laws. Yeah, of course, uh, in reality, in the German parliament. Uh, in, in the other parliament, there are, the Italian parliament too. Uh, in the French parliament, there are less lawyers, uh, but, but, but there are many others. And, and of course, in the, min, in the, in the ministries, uh, so in the, in the state departments, uh, if, uh, uh, of course, uh, they are acting and writing and, uh, and, and thinking and uh, maneuvering and so on. Uh, uh, many, many lawyers, that is of course true. Huh? Um, but, um, but from the political theory point of view, huh, um, uh, it's not the lawyers who decide about the law. It are the, 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 the deputies of the of the parliament. Uh, so, so it's the political scene, the political sphere, which are making the laws in terms of statutes. But the jurists, the lawyers, they are working. Let's say, in reality, in when there are facts which happen, so when there are societal conflicts or conf conflict between two or more people, huh? um, uh, then um, then this is a becomes the that enters the laws enters the juristic sphere. Uh, so draw a distinction. If you prefer, we can continue in in, in French. Uh... <laughs> je, je regarde le, le, le support euh, technique. Est-ce que nous avons maintenant des, des questions? No questions. No questions. No questions. So everybody is. Uh, it's tired. It's, no, I, no, I would say if there are no questions, everybody is convinced. Uh, of course. Uh, it's a little bit dangerous, uh, come idea, but. Uh, yeah, I, I prefer always in the. Because if you speak again a little bit on the seminars, huh, you know, here, in, in, okay, uh, each of us. And Falk, uh, Bretschneider, and, and myself. And, uh, certainly, we are also different, uh, even we are colleagues and friends. But I don't, uh, everybody of us here at the Ecole des Études en Sciences Sociales, we make seminars in a different way. You know? So, uh, so, uh, so there are people, of course, uh, that want to convince, uh, and other people they want to provoke, uh, third people they want to tell the truth, uh, and. Uh, and um, and I must say I'm uh, of all of three of these types. Huh? I want to tell the truth. I want to convince. And uh, of course, um, uh, I uh, you want to provoke. I, I, I want to provoke. Huh? <laughs> uh, and so, um, so 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 yeah. But but this is really in uh, in our real seminars, if I may say so. Huh? Um, uh, especially when it is. In presence and not um, uh, not in, in a remote way as here. Um, um, uh, I at least and many of my colleagues, of course, too. Huh, uh, we are very very interested to to discuss with the students uh, and that, that the students can can um, can uh, not only ask questions but also bring their own views, huh, especially. And this is a this is really a particularity here in the, the EH ESS. I have always a little bit, uh, for me, it's always a little bit difficult to, 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 to pronounce USS because you know the SS at the end is not so, uh, so, so convenient, but uh, especially for a German tongue. Huh? But uh, uh, so EHUSS, uh, um, the, um, the, the thing is that. Um, uh, uh, the stu we have no departments here at the uh, SS. so there is not there is not the philosophy department, the law department, and so on, huh? the law schools, and so on. Uh, but um, uh, we have um, we, all of our seminars are open to everybody, huh? and um, and for instance, in my seminars, but also in the seminars of every of our of our colleagues. Huh? Um, there are there are law, the students in law, in philosophy, in history, in anthropology, in economics, in ethnology, in I don't know history, of course, uh, in musicology, uh, in uh, 
in, in, in whatever. And so what is really, really interesting here at the ESS uh, is, um, is the variety of, of scientific and let's say intellectual and let's say thoughts, I don't know, um, horizons. Huh? And, uh, and, and, and this is, and it is really a pleasure to teach here and I hope, because I cannot speak in their place, but I think it's also a pleasure uh, for the students to to be here because um, they have here, uh, um, let's say, um, an environment, uh, a an, uh, an pedag pedagogic environment, which is hardly, very hardly, or not to say, is not to be found uh, elsewhere in the world. Thank you, Ryan, for this uh, advertising for the for the for, for our school. I agree uh, completely. Uh, uh, sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about Schmidt. 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 Karl Schmidt. Karl Schmidt. I um, I admit, I confess uh, that I find a little bit disturbing uh, this fascination uh, for yeah. Schmidt, and uh, I'm not completely convinced by your difference you made. Uh, between the Schmidt before 43 and the Schmidt after 33? Yeah, this is, a, this is a huge question and I have no answer. So um, um, I begin always, I begin always to say Schmidt, Karl Schmidt, uh, uh, is the greatest, I, I mentioned it, but uh, I mentioned it again, I say it again, it's the greatest, the greatest, the, the hugest, I don't know, uh, asshole in law of the 20th century. In YouTube, uh, you have a beep. Uh, uh, yeah, you can make exactly. a beep. If, if there is a beep, huh? say a criminal I said, uh, or... a hole. So, you know. <laughs> so um, uh, uh, because, uh, uh, and it's true, huh? so sure, because he was. Uh, um, uh, anti-Semite. Anti huh? uh, he was a supporter of the Nazi regime. Huh? Not only um, a supporter. Uh, no, uh, not only. He was. He was, the, a, the, he was one of the. He was the jurist of the Nazi regime. Huh? He called uh, the crown the jurist. The crown the, jurist of the, the Nazi. The crown lawyer huh? of the of the Nazi regime. Huh? So, um, um, so 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 there's no he uh, justified. Uh, the the night of the long knives. Uh, so when Hitler um, uh, uh, ordered uh, the murder of um, of the of the SA, uh, the, the SS and the SA. Uh, and so uh, uh, concurrential group uh, within the Nazi regime. Uh, um, and um, uh, so this is the this is the, the most um, I don't know how do you call it the most uh, 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 the article which is a, which 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 really less left us workless huh? uh, when uh, Karl Schmidt um, wrote in thirty four the um, an article in the most uh, uh, in the most uh, famous uh, German uh, law journal um, uh, 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 entitled um, the article entitled um, the title uh, the Führer hmm? the Führer protects the law hmm? uh, by murdering people hmm? so um, so. There's no doubt, and and you can, and that's, it doesn't make sense to say we are Karl Schmidt. He was a Nazi. Uh, he was supported by the Nazi regime only between 1933 and 1936. This is true. After 36, he was banned in a certain sense, not banned outside Germany, but but uh, but he was no more um, no more uh, welcome. Uh, to the to the Nazi um, uh, people, huh? and um, uh, but 
you know, he wasn't Catholic, anti-Semite, um, who after 45, till his death, was not capable to say that Adolf Hitler was not the good guy for Germany and for the world. Um, so he was, he continued to think that the movement that uh, Adolf Hitler created was a strong movement and a good movement. But, but, but there are facts. And the facts are that in the texts till 33, of course, you can, as I said, you can always uh, read something into text. I will, uh, with all what I have said, uh, I will not say now um, uh, this is for sure or <laughs> clear. Um, but um, but there are no um, uh, direct and explicit um, uh, uh, agreement with the Nazis uh, before thirty three, hmm? before the or January thirty three. Hmm? Even in the last text, what I quoted huh, from thirty two, so uh, legality and legitimacy. Huh? Uh, uh, in fact, it was a text, I don't want to say against Hitler and the NSDAP, huh? um, but it could have been and, and was also um, um, uh, uh, understood uh, as a text to, to save uh, democracy by installing um, uh, uh, um, the, the state of exception uh, uh, to, to also to go against the Nazis. But however, hmm? uh, so this is before 33. And after 45, and this is a fact that there's, there's, this is, let's say, facta bruta. Hmm? Um, Kaschmidt was one of the most influential guys, intellectual people um, in the uh, German Federal Republic. Um, people from the left wing of politics as people from the right wing of politics. So conservative and uh, revolutionary and uh, progress, progressive uh, uh, people, which became very famous afterwards hmm? in, in academia, in politics, in journalism. Hmm? They were going in and out in Plettenberg. Plettenberg, that is a little town. This is a bled. Uh, <laughs> this is a village. Hmm? This is a village where Karl Schmidt lived. Huh? And as he could no more give lectures at university, I mean, he was no more professor. Um, um, uh, he, um, uh, he, uh, he, 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 there was a sort of saloon, alors, uh, salon, salon uh, in his house, uh, and uh, and everybody came into, and he, he, he uh, also students, uh, for instance, Reinhard Koselleck, one of the most, the greatest German historians, uh, also, even if there were. Um, uh, not of the same age, of course, he was a student huh? uh, in the 50s. Huh? Um, uh, he was very, very close to Karl Schmidt, huh? and, um, and there's a correspondence, uh, a huge correspondence between the two. Huh? And uh, so there was a fascination. Okay? Uh, and this is real. Okay, and now why? Why? I don't know, of course, no, nobody knows. And uh, oh, to, to, con excuse me, to continue, because he was dead in, in 1985. Hmm? He was, was he became way, way old. Hmm? Uh, 1985. Hmm? And um, 
um, till today, till today, Carl Schmidt is always present. If you take a polit, um, uh, uh, how do you call it in English, uh, uh, one who is um, interested in politics, huh? uh, polit pol polit politics scientist, huh? politics scientist, uh, Chantal Mouffe. Belgium, huh? Chantal Mouffe. Huh? Um, and he, she is really, uh, I don't know, if I'm right, huh? and I think I'm right, huh? she's not right wing. She's, she's more left wing. Huh? So, Karl Schmidt is a reference. I don't want to say that she's uh, d'accord huh? uh, with Karl Schmidt, but it's a reference. Huh? Um, there are many, many others. Hmm? So, Karl Schmidt is in the discussion today. And if you look what is what is happening now, huh? now in this moment huh? in, in in our neighborhood, in our European, uh, in, within our Europe, huh? so that means in Russia and then especially in, in, in Ukraine, Ukraine huh? yeah. um, uh, Karl Schmidt um, is, is also a reference huh? from the one and from the other side because he wrote a book, the theory of the partisan. Uh, um, uh, so, so it's always to see who are partisan of whom, of, 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 the, of, the, of the left revolutionary, right revolutionary, Nazism, communism, and so on. Um, so, just so short, why, the, uh, why, short, short, why? Because he's fascinating. And why is he fascinating? Because he has a style. That's all. He has a style which other ones doesn't have, or not so much. And what is his style? His style is a style to talk always in oppositions. The most famous opposition is, of course, um, friend and enemy. Mm -hmm. uh, Land and sea, land and sea, and so on. Um, and and he is not academic. He he was with Hans Kelsen, the, the with two or three others, of course. Huh? Certainly, but certainly with Kelsen, the, 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 these are the two great constitutional and public lawyers. Uh, in the 20th century of German tongue. This is for sure. Um, and um, Kelsen was a scientific one. Uh, Karl Schmidt was literature. He was a poetic one. Karl Schmidt, when he was young, that means in 1912 and before, and even 17, 18, 19, 20, hmm? he was not sure to do law, to make law, to study law, to write in law. He, he was very interested in literature. He wrote literature. He was a poet. Hmm? Um, I don't want to say that he was like Kafka, hmm? not at all. Hmm? But, but there are some, that's why I quoted and mentioned Kafka, hmm? there are some some uh, similarities, huh? and um, and so um, he's suggestive. Hmm? Um, so this is not to defend him. I defend him not at all. Hmm? Uh, he was an asshole, beep. Uh, but um, uh, this text on law and judgment for some is a difficult text. Not so literary as other texts from him, but but it's really a great text to understand how functions law, law as a whole. Um, so how to say? Huh? Um, um, I don't like this word so much, but um, uh, when. You could say he was a strong thinker. That was 
that doesn't mean that he is a good man. He was not a good man, not at all. He was certainly one of the most disgusting men uh, in law in the, in the 20th century. But, but um, this is the question, and we should make a new seminar about that, because we should, in this case, also mention other cases. Louis Ferdinand Céline, for instance. Um, uh, but all the, let's say, the, the question, the post-colonial question, which is at stake today, hmm? that means all the question of memory. And uh, uh, as um, we have to put in a, in a sort of, uh, 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 in the grave, mm. uh, uh, all of these authors, and painters, and um, musicians, think on Shostakovich mm, and wow. others, mm, um, uh, uh, and all all these uh, um, uh, should we should we lock them up? Lock them up, as Trump said always, lock up, lock her up, mm, lock them up. And um, and that's it. I don't think so. I think we should always look the evil in the face and not put him away. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I have let this uh, in this uh, room uh, like this. Uh, have we? No, no question. So I, I, I ask a, a last one. Continue. Ah, oh, I thought that now it's it's, it's over. Huh? Uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm, I'm sure that's a question that you that you would like. Literature and and law. Yeah, literature your, and law. Your, your your lecture began with Schmidt and ends with Kafka. Yeah, literature and law. Yeah, this is um. Uh, I will be very short because this is really um. Um, uh, also a huge question, um, uh, and I cannot answer it in, in five, ten, and even not in five hundred minutes. Huh? So uh, I, I, I sh uh, there's more time needed. Huh? Uh, uh, also, what does it mean, law and literature, laws as literature? I will, I will not uh, begin to, to 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 say something about that. But I will tell you, perhaps you have felt it a little bit uh, by this kind of lecture or this kind of text or this kind of thinking, let's say. Uh, I'm convinced that um, uh, we should not uh, talk about law and literature and perhaps law as literature, but I would say the best theory of law is literature. Because, you know, um, okay, we are here at an école, it's a school, so it's sort of university. And of course, in university, you have to be scientific. And even in the humanities and in the you know, social science, social sciences, I'm not so sure to know very well what it means, social sciences. What is this, the sciences? There's a whole history um, from the, the end and of the 19th, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, where we should talk about the, the adventure of these social sciences, sciences, which are sciences, because they are also natural sciences, and that's all. Um, the best social sciences are, or is the Comédie Humaine de Balzac, Honoré de Balzac. This is social sciences at its best. That means without being science. And literature and law 
Um, I would not so much say that the practice of law is literature, of course, you have to convince. But this is this is a sort of uh, American way of looking to the law, and that is especially criminal law, and this is especially convincing a jury hmm, uh, in a trial. Hmm? And um, uh, uh, of course, you have to tell a story. That's true. And if, and, and, and if the story is good, you can uh, um, have an influence on the jury and so on. Huh? Um, but I don't want to talk about the literary figures, huh? uh, so the rhetorics huh? of law, huh? which has also to do with literature, it's true. But if we think about law, so when we are dealing with theory, philosophy, history, and sociology of law, then perhaps we can much more, can learn much more from Kafka, Balzac, and Heinrich von Kleist, and, uh, and Goethe, uh, and, and, and Shakespeare, and, and, and whatever. Um, much we can learn much more from them um, than on the thousands of books and articles from legal theorists, legal philosophers, and so on. That means from my colleagues and myself. Uh, and um, I include, of course, myself into this. Um, so perhaps this scientific point of view, which we, of course, this is a deformation professionnelle huh? um, that we have all here as professors of, of something huh? uh, in the uh, USS. Huh? Um, perhaps this is only a footnote in history because universities, which are doing and teaching science, scientific views of the society, this is only a relatively short time that we are doing so. That means more or less the last 200 years, more, more or less. But perhaps, and this has nothing to do with fake news and fake sciences. Perhaps the, the poetic structure of our existence, to say it like this, um, should be also introduced, introduced more than it is the case into our scientific, quasi or pseudo scientific um, manners to teach our views of the world. Thank so you. So, not the end, huh? because I. Thank you very much, uh, Rainer. The, the lecture was a little bit depressing, and now the view for the future for social scientists is a little bit depressing too, but uh, it's not. <laughs> no, a because it's, it's, a, it's. No, it's. We a have joy. to read more. It's a we, joy. Have, we have to. We, we have to have more time to read the literature. That I uh, agree uh, completely. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Rainer. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, all the people in the internet uh, following this, uh, this lecture and this uh, discussion. Thank you very much uh, for our support time, uh, team. And I, <laughs> support time, I'm tired a little bit too. The support team. And I have to uh, make a, a, a last um, announce. Uh, the next uh, Spring Talk lecture is given on uh, Wednesday. 6th of April, it's a round table um, about um, the journals, some journals uh, were edited um, at the OHSS, LOM et ANA, and you are welcome. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Thank you very much, bye-bye. <laughs>